church. Just so glad to see you all, and just so glad to be able to be here to um, celebrate our Lord, to come and worship Him. And I wanted to share with you a couple scriptures we've been studying with the ladies, um, the Life You Long For Bible study. And I want to share first with um, Revelation 4.11. And um, this is um, a hymn of praise. Um, and I'll read it to you first from Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they exist and came to be. In this hymn of praise, it's all creatures in the heavens and down on the earth will praise and honor God. Our God, he is the creator. He's our creator. And he creates from a heart of love. And he's created all things. And I wanted to share with you that we were created by our God to worship him. And he is worthy of our praise to know all the things that he's done for us, for what Jesus did on that cross, to receive the glory, honor, and power. And so just as we start our worship today, to reflect that our God, he created all things. He created us, but we chose, he chose us, and we are his creation. The second scripture is from Zephaniah, is um, chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take delight in you. As you, his, part of his creation, he delights in you. And in his love, he'll no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And to know that our God, he delights in us so much, he is singing over us. And um, in our Bible study, uh, Christy Knuckles, she t talks about us being the beloved in every study. It's about how important it is to know we're beloved of God. And this word beloved means to be greatly loved. And no one can love us like God loves us. There's nothing to ever compare any other love but the one that God has for us. And we're so thankful that the Holy Spirit lives in us and our, our hearts are open to the truth that we are loved by God. No matter what's happening around us, we are loved by God. The Lord is with us. His love rests upon us. Right now, he's rejoicing over us with singing. So we're just dust, as Pastor Tony will tell us lots of times. We are dust, but our God, in his love, is singing over us and rejoicing. As believers, let us live in the reality of truth that we're known as God's beloved. And rather than striving and working to earn his love, just accept that he loves us. We're called beloved. Jesus, we, we desire that you become the center of our lives and so that others will see Jesus shining in us. Jesus is our example day by day. He expresses the love of God through him and his life and through the word. So as his beloved children, so undeserving of his love, yet chosen to receive it, as we come to worship today, let's just draw closer to the source of love, following God with our whole heart. So let's have a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, Lord, we are your beloved children. And we know that you are the creator who created us to worship you. Lord, let us put aside all those things, Lord, that are stopping us from knowing you better today. Let us come and have a heart ready to receive you, to know we're beloved, and also to know that you sing over us today, too. And we pray all these things in your precious name of Jesus. Amen. My prayer before this message is verse 2 of that song. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. Turn with me in the Bible to Genesis chapter 18, please. Abraham is visited by three men. 
angels and the Lord himself. And Abraham is going to plead his case for Sodom. Verse 16, when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great power, great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just one more time. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham returned home. I'm pretty sure that Abraham knew how bad things were in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was awful. The wickedness was so prevalent. And he was concerned for the cities that were to be destroyed, but I think primarily his concern went out for Lot and his family. And that's how we ended up with the number 10, because we know for sure that Lot and his wife and two virgin daughters left the city, they fled the city, but there were da other daughters and other sons-in-laws, and I'm pretty sure that we can assume that there were 10 in his family. That's how we came up with that number. And the sons-in-laws and the other daughters laughed at him because they thought he was joking when he told them they had to leave. But miraculously, they were brought out of the city, the four of them. And Abraham was concerned for his, he called Lot his brother at one point in time. He was concerned for him. He knew he was a righteous man, he had a good heart, and he grieved him in himself, Lot did, for the cities and for the wickedness that was there. It talks about that in 2 Peter. But he was considered a righteous man, even though he was not <laughs> a really good person. He offered his two daughters up to the, 
to the sodomites. He said, do what you want to them. I can't go there. I can't find that in my head, my heart, any part of my soul. But yet he was considered a righteous man. And Abraham was concerned for him and his family. And so he went boldly before the Lord. And this is an interesting thing that I thought about. He went in a boldness that was tempered with humility. If you look at verse 25, he says, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? That's the wrong verse. I meant 27. Then Abraham spoke up again, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. He recognized who God was. And he recognized who he is. He recognized the compassionate nature of God, the righteous and the just nature of God. God knew what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew when he had said to Sarah, you're going to have a child. She laughed inside of herself. And it says that very clearly in the wording within herself. She didn't go, ha, ha, no way. She went, hmm, right. And then she lied and said, I didn't. I didn't laugh. And she, the Lord said to her, yes, you did. The Lord knows what's in the heart. The Lord knew what was in the heart of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he knew that there wouldn't be 10. He knew that there wouldn't be 10. He knew that the destruction that he was going to bring on those cities was based on his justice and his righteousness. And yet Abraham petitions him boldly. Boldly and just he keeps going out on a limb until it gets creakier and creakier and creakier. But the Lord never stops him. The Lord loves that kind of boldness in his saints. He loves that kind of attitude that says, I will continue to petition the Lord for what I believe I want to see. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked, Lord? He also recognized not only the Lord's ability to do what he said he was going to do, but his authority and his sovereignty over the situation. He had the right to do what he said, and, and Abraham acknowledged that. But he was comfortable enough in his position with the Lord, who he had obeyed, who he had followed, who he had served, to come to him boldly. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's from Hebrews. You are all familiar with those words as we sing them regularly. I wonder how much our hearts are burdened like Abraham's, for those who are about to be destroyed, the righteous and the wicked. I wonder how much my heart is burdened for someone in my family who is living in a way that is not pleasing, and they need the Lord more than anyone else. And I must go before him to the throne of grace because I am dust. I am humble when I approach the Lord, yet I go with boldness. Do I continue to petition for those needs that I recognize? The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? 
In Amos chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. What is it that concerns our hearts? What is it that occupies our minds? How many times do we go back and petition the Lord for that which we know needs to happen? Is the hour coming when he won't be listening or when our prayers may not have the effect? Can we ask him to move on our hearts and do what we know needs to be done to ask him? We have that opportunity. And he has that desire for us to continue to petition him. We are living in a time when people in the church believe that if, they t if the Lord, if, if our freedom of speech is inhibited, then the church loses its ability. I say balderdash. The church has power. Every believer has power in their prayer closet to ask the Lord to move upon the hearts and the minds of those who need him, who are not compliant, who are offensive. In Romans 8.34, we are told that the Lord sits at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding for us. And in Hebrews 7, 25, therefore Jesus our Lord is able to save us completely or eternally. Those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. The formation of Christ within our souls means that we want to be like Jesus. And Jesus is interceding for me and interceding for each one of us for the needs that we have. He is the mediator between God and man. And on our behalf, he is praying for us in our moments of weakness, in our sin, in our doubt, in our lack of faith, in our self-confidence. He is interceding for us. And so shouldn't we be like our Lord and be continually interceding for those who have need to know him and the grace and the freedom? And how much effort do we put into that? Like Abraham, do we continue to go back and say again and again and again and forgive me for bothering you with this one more time, but I haven't seen the results. Give me faith to continue to come back to you and to believe that you can, you will, and you are going to move upon this request. And the Lord yielded at every turn. But Abraham knew when it was time to quit. Maybe because of his earthliness. Because there were ten in his family that he wanted saved and he got his promise. He got what he wanted out of it. But it is the duty of every Christian to be in prayer for our loved ones, our friends, those that we care about, our nation, which we see failing and going in a bad way. But you know what? There are millions and millions of good and righteous people like the police and fire departments which re gratefully receive the word of the Lord and put it out there for people to go to. There are millions and millions of good and righteous people living in this country. But they need a shepherd. They need the prayers of God's elect. They need the prayers of God's chosen. They need the prayers of those who are faithful and confident in God to do a work that goes beyond the ability of political, social, and cultural intervention into the circumstances and situations. 
They need an intercessing, interceding church, an interceding people, and certainly the Lord will honor that if we are faithful, like Abraham was, to not get, be satisfied until we believe that the job is done. And I just want to jump ahead, if you will, to chapter 19, verse 29. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. He remembered Abraham. Will he remember me? Will he remember me and my petitions and my passion and my great desire of my heart for what I wanted to see him do for another person? My prayers for me are often self-centered, but my prayers for others are those which the Lord really, really craves, I believe. He already knows what we need before we ask him. He has that. And we should talk to him about, about those things because they cause us angst and worry and uncertainty and doubt. And he, he likes proving himself or he likes showing his hand to us. He does enjoy that, I believe. David Wilkerson said this. He said, you can go in the spirit to any place on earth, to any nation, to any home, to any person. You can touch an unreached people while on your knees. Indeed, your secret closet may be the headquarters for a movement of God's spirit over an entire nation. Imagine that. Now that's a positive thought. It really is a positive thought. And I took last week off because I thought my, my, I thought that my thoughts were becoming a bit tainted with negativity. And I don't like that. I'm uncomfortable with it. But to think that when you go to your prayer closet, you can move the heart and the hand of God. But how bad do you really want it? You want the microwave prayer. Push number one. Beep. All done. That's not the Lord's plan for us when we pray. He wants us to persist and petition him for what we believe is right. That we would pray for the millions of good people in this country who are being lied to, who are being deceived, who are being taken advantage of. And you know, I had a thought... I've had a thought over the last year or so. I cannot spend, I do not want to spend my time and my mental energy trying to outwit a wicked person. It's wrong. It's a waste. It saturates my soul with the poison that is, it's terrible. But to believe that I have the ability and the power to affect the hand of God in a culture that is, quite frankly, falling down, that I can petition him to move, hey, nothing is impossible for God. In one reference, he calls his word like a hammer that crushes hard things. And that I would go to him and I would say, Lord, bring your word and pound it on the hearts of the wicked. Pound it on the hearts of those liars. Pound it on the hearts of people who are thinking they're doing good, but they, are, they really don't understand the truth. That God would honor that type of prayer for a country or for a person, I believe is true even though they don't want to hear it, even though it's obvious that they reject, there are people 
who the Lord is touching. We had a young lady come in the last two weeks, Charisma. The Lord is dealing with, and she is seeking him. She got herself a Bible. And as I talked to her last week, I said, um, I said, are you reading that? She says, oh, yeah. I says, well, there's a verse in, in, um, in Romans chapter 8. I said, can you turn there and look at it? You know, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because she's really wish, wrestling with guilt. And um, she opened it, Romans chapter 8, and the highlights were like every third or fourth verse. And she says, I have questions about these things. I said, well, I hope you'll feel free to ask if you have questions. So there are people who want to hear and there are people who don't want to hear. I want to read, by closing, I want to read something from Charles Spurgeon. He said, if those who are lost will not hear you speak, they cannot prevent you from praying. Do they jest at your exhortations? They cannot disturb you at your prayers. Are they far away so that you cannot reach them? Your prayers can reach them. Have they declared that they will never listen to you again, nor see your face? Never mind. God has a voice that they must hear. Speak to him, and he will make them feel. Though they now treat you despitefully, rendering evil for your good, follow them with your prayers. Never let them perish for lack of your supplications. Let's pray. Lord, I asked you this morning and yesterday and the day before to move on our hearts. And I pray, Lord God, that these words from your scriptures would have an impact on our souls, that our hearts would be pounded by the rock and the hammer of your word, that we would soften under the mighty blessing of your grace in our lives, that we would crave it for those who we love and care for, and that we would not stop or cease to persist petitioning you on their behalf. Lord, I pray for your blessing on this nation. I pray for your blessing on this nation because it is sick spiritually. And there are where, other places in your word where you say, if just one would pray, if just one would intercede, I would save. So Lord, here we are. Let us take that from this place and move on it in our lives and establish a, a plan for ourselves personally and even corporately, Lord, on how we might pray and persist and ask you and expect you to move in ways that we cannot understand and have not seen for many, many years. So I ask these things in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in this church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.